Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, and we'll be reading from chapter 5, verses 15 through to 21. Ephesians 5, 15 through to 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you once again for your word and as we consider today the call to walk in wisdom, we come to you, Lord, as the source of all true wisdom. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would be here with us today, teaching us, correcting us, training us in all all righteousness, that, Lord, in all things we would live lives that are worthy and honour and in glory to your name. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. There were two friends that were talking one day and one of them said to his friend that he'd been seeing a very interesting video on YouTube, of all things. He'd been looking at something where a a philosopher had been interviewed and he'd, he'd been asked the question about what is wrong with the world? What is the source of all the world's problems? And his response was such that he said that no matter what it is that we look at in the world and all the world's problems, whether the problems stem from politics or from war, or whether they come from poverty and injustice, or whether the problems relate to weather and climate, they all come down to two things. The problems of this world can be reduced to two things, that is, ignorance and apathy. So he said to his friend, what do you think of that? To which his friend replied, I don't know, and I don't care. (laughs) And it's often the case too, that there are many things that we look at in life and we look at it and we go, well, we don't know and we don't care. And sometimes there can be great apathy, but other times too, you see people really willing to get behind a cause. Uh, They're happy to dispense with their own wants and desires if there's something that they really strongly believe in or feel that they want to get behind. The question then would be raised, do we even do the same for ourselves? For the faith that we believe in, do we treat our faith with ignorance and apathy? Or do we come to the study of God's Word to really seek to get to know Him and apply the truths of the Word in our lives? That we can impact our relationships with one another, we can impact our relationships with those in the world, but more importantly, that we would see a growth in our relationship to our God and Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that really, what it comes down to today is what we're looking at is the call to walk in wisdom. And as we step through this, we'll be seeing the call to walk wisely in verses 15 to 17, but that is reflected then in the call to worship wisely as well. Are we worshipping in all aspects of our lives in a manner that is befitting to God for everything that He's done for us? And we've been seeing this through the series, the call to walk in light, the call to walk in love, the call here to walk in wisdom. Is this befitting of the Christian, of the Christian life to which we have been called? Beginning, therefore, in verse 15 is another call from Paul to the Ephesian church and by extension to us. He says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as the wise. This is a call to diligence in our Christian walk. We need to walk, as Paul says, carefully. Look carefully then how you walk, not as the unwise, but as the wise. There is a call here to really examine our behavior, what we're doing in life. And we've looked at this previously, 
There is the character within us, but how is that expressed through our conduct and through our conversation with others? Are we walking in a manner that's worthy? Are we walking wisely? And we're called to examine our conduct. Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see that you're in the faith. And we spoke about that briefly as well, that uh, oftentimes we'll be going through the Christian life and we have doubts as to whether we are walking in a worthy manner. We question, am I really a Christian? And we saw that we have assurance through the gospel of everything that Christ has done. We have assurance of our faith. But we're called still to test ourselves to see that we're in the faith. Do we see fruit in our lives in keeping with repentance? And that is the change. So we're called to examine ourselves carefully, examine ourselves deliberately. But he says, not as the unwise, but as the wise. The emphasis here when we look at the unwise as the opposite to the wise, it is is giving this emphasis of somebody that's in effect, they're stupid, they're ignorant. Or you could put that in the context of idiocy, somebody that's stumbling through life like an idiot. And Paul's in effect saying, don't be an idiot, walk wisely as the wise. And we've been seeing this in our midweek studies going through Proverbs together. In Proverbs, we see that there are three types of people, only three types of people in the world. There are the wise, there are the foolish, and there are the simple. The wise, as we see in the Proverbs, are those that heed uh, heed the words of wisdom, that we see that the, be- the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And through adhering to God's wisdom, we are promised a prolonged life. Whereas on the flip side, when we look at the foolish, on the other end of the spectrum, those that are living lives in rebellion against God, they reject God in all facets of life. But what comes with that is a more dangerous, a shortened and a perilous life. But there is a third type of person that we see in Proverbs, and that's the simple. And the simple are really those people that are either naive, or they're ignorant, or that they're wavering. They're sitting on the fence. They can't decide whether to choose wisdom or whether they would go with their instincts and want to choose folly. But here we see the call to wisdom, the call for us as Christians to walk wisely as well. And so from diligence, we then move towards looking at the call to be discerning in life. Verse 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Another way of looking at the best use of time, you may have seen this in other translations, is to redeem the time or to buy back the time. It's an interesting call because so often we can waste time through life, can't we? We waste time on frivolous, useless things and we think, well, there are three hours I'm not going to get back. Um, There are times we will just waste it on all manner of different things, but we are called here to walk wisely, to buy back the time, to watch our time. What are we spending our time in? What are we investing in? Are there the temporal things of this world or are we investing in things of eternity, living a life to which God has called us? But note, he says here, is that the days are evil. We just have to look outside our front door and we can see that all around us is evil. And it is so easy to be distracted with all manner of things in life that can take our eyes off God, take our eyes off his word, take our eyes off everything that he calls us to. And that's where we've seen in Proverbs that the fool calls loudly. It's got a strong voice and many will heed that. They'll be sucked into it but we see that its end is destruction. But this call to wisdom, not only are we to be diligent in our walk and discerning in our walk, making the best use of time and heeding this wisdom, but thirdly, we need to be definite, as we see in verse 17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Being definite is something that we need to pursue God's word and look at that and and we we want to understand what is God's will for our lives. I think we all have that burning question, don't we? What is God's will for me in this circumstance? Do I take this job or do I take the other job? Do I live in this city or in that city? 
what, do I, what decisions do I need to make in all manner of facets and different dimensions of life? And it's something that often we are thinking a lot about. What is God's will? What is it that he wants me to do? But we need to be very careful that when we do that is our focus and our motivation. Because often a lot of so-called seeking God's will can often be based out of our own selfish desires. So God, your will be done, but really I want this. I really want that because we're kind of drawn by that old self as we've looked at previously. We want to put on the old clothes and live a comfortable, happy life and live like the world. And we hope that God's leading us in that way would be not the tough or the hard way or some alternate plan. And we, we debate these different things and we try to listen to the voices in our head and discern what is God's will in that. But we need to be very careful that we have a correct focus on understanding what God's will for our lives is. That as we walk wisely, we're being diligent, discerning and very definite that we understand God's will and we walk in that. And so really it comes down to now a question of wisdom versus folly. Are we walking wisely uh, or are we walking foolishly? How about some definitions of foolishness or some examples of that? It's foolish to be wanting to amass assets, wealth, possessions and all manner of things in life to go above and beyond just simply being content and comfortable with what we have. But we want more. We want more. We want to invest in things that at the end of the day we can't take with us. In fact, you can amass lots of wealth, but uh, you reach retirement age, what happens if you die early and someone else spends all that inheritance for you? It's often the case is that you've, you've sought to amass all this wealth. Jesus spoke as well of the parable of the guy that built bigger barns, but he couldn't spend everything that he'd amassed. But that's foolishness. Amassing the, temp in the temporal things of this world, but without thinking of the eternal inheritance and investing in that to which we have been called. An inheritance that is unperishing, that will never fade, that will never rust, that moth and, and the thief won't come to steal and destroy. Another definition of foolishness. How often do we send our children to school to give them the best education that money can buy, yet we neglect to invest in them true wisdom? <clears throat> We'll teach them in all the things of the world and in school, but are we investing in their lives through the scriptures, helping them to understand God and true biblical wisdom? Or when we look at foolishness even for ourselves, that we will go away and study, we'll amass degree after degree, becoming wise, knowledge and learned. In fact, we'll proclaim ourselves to be wise yet we don't take the time to discern what the true will of God is for our lives. And we spend lives pursuing all manner of other things. But do you want to know what God's will for your life is? I can put it very, very simply for you. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's God's will for your life. Yes, there are little different things as we're plotting our way through life. God will order our steps. But at the end of the day, the simple fact is that God's will is for our sanctification, first and foremost. We are called, as we've been seeing through this series, to live as children of light. We know that we are in the world, but we're not necessarily of the world. In effect, we're just passing through. We live lives of humility, lives that ought to be pleasing to God. And that is reflected in our relationships to each other, as we've seen the call to walk in love. We've also seen the call to walk in our relationship to this world as a witness for Christ in this world, but also in our relationship to God. And this is what wise living looks like. It's worshipping wisely. Verse 18 and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, it's very easy to take this into a whole discussion around the appropriate use of alcohol. To drink or not to drink, that is not the question. 
In fact, though, what we're needing to look at is what is the context here? And Paul is setting up for us a choice between two things. If you were to be arrested tomorrow for being under the influence of something, would you be under the influence of drink or of sin or like that old nature? Or would you be under, under the influence of the Spirit? Is that what would be seen in your life if you so-called breathe it into such a breathalyzer? But the question then is, who is in control of your life? And we saw that in our Bible reading before from the Gospel of John. Are you a slave to a sin or are you a slave to righteousness? It's one or the other. If you're not a Christian, you are a slave to sin. And we've seen that as well in, in Ephesians. Paul says that very clearly, is that we've got these corrupt selves. We are living in ignorance to the things of God. We are enslaved to sin, whether we see it, whether we believe it and accept that or not. Or alternatively, we can be a slave to righteousness. All of us ought to be putting to death ourselves daily and walking in the righteousness of Christ. And so the call here is not to be drunk or intoxicated, or as Paul says here, that leads to debauchery. That's a reckless, sinful license. Now, I will address this briefly in terms of alcohol. Now, obviously, it is something that we've often focused on in some churches and made a big thing of whether one can drink or not to drink. And that's not really the question here, but it is worth just culturally just pointing out what alcohol looked like in the past versus today. In Paul's day, alcohol was not quite what it is today where we've got great refinery and, and you'll see that a lot of the wineries is turning out drinks with quite high alcoholic content. But in Paul's day, in fact, it was very minimal alcoholic content. The purpose of the wine was often when they're traveling is to mix it with water to purify the water and make it easy to drink. And it was therefore often used even for medicinal purposes. Paul said to Timothy, take a little wine, it's good for your stomach. But in that day, to be drunk with wine, because there is such low alcoholic content, you would have to drink a lot of the stuff. That would have to be some big lavish party where you're just drinking and drinking to the point that if you did get drunk, that would obviously be leading to debauchery and other manner of sins. But we need to be obviously especially careful today when it comes to drink. Not that we would want to make a hard and fast rule as to whether it's okay to drink or not to drink. The question is, is the drink or anything in your life controlling you? And that is fundamentally the question. If you're drinking to the point that you're losing control of your senses, then of course that is a very dangerous place to be. What Paul is saying here rather is if you're going to be drunk with something, be filled with the Spirit to excess, to overflowing. And so often when we're looking at passages like this and other parts of Scripture, we can get so focused on all the don'ts. When do we turn around and look at the do's? Because it's not the prohibition here about drink that's in question, it's around the do's. What are we called to do? Be filled with the Spirit. That is our focus, not a matter of drink. Being filled with the Spirit, that is generously, completely to overflowing that the Spirit is seen not only in our lives directly, but it flows out into all manner of relationships and all facets of our life. We know that the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5 are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We may have remembered those lists and we try to exercise those in our life and it's easy to quote, but do we read on also to verse 25 that says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And that is what a life of walking in the Spirit or being drunk with the Spirit would look like, that we're in step with the Spirit at every step of the way. What is His will for our life? Our sanctification, that we would see the fruits of the Spirit have at work in our lives. We are called to be filled with the Spirit. But then verse 19, he shows us how that could also be reflected. Within the church context, we could see in verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, 
singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Note here, there's this context of addressing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And it's, in some respects, it's quite uh, ironic that when we're singing songs, we're all facing the front. How would it be that if we actually turned around and faced each other and we were singing in each other's faces, whether it was in tune or not in tune, what would that be like? The, the purpose of this is to say that we sing songs that not only glorify God, but these songs can also be of great encouragement to one another. When we're feeling down, when we're feeling depressed, when we've lost a job, we've lost loved ones, where we're going through all manner of trials and tribulations in life, often the best encouragement that we can get is when we're hanging out with other Christians, not just talking about the things of the world, but where we can open up the scriptures, or in fact, when we can even sing the scriptures to one another. Words of encouragement, words that praise God, where our focus is on God and all the good things that He's done for us. And it helps us take our eyes off all the little cares and troubles of life. I remember a, a picture once that somebody had portrayed is that if you keep your eyes on Christ, on the source of light, you won't be looking down to stumble over the things that are in front of you. You just keep your eyes on Him and He will light your path. But when we, we keep our eyes on Christ and when we sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, when we stay in the Word, it brings a source of life and encouragement to us that we can't help but be filled with the Spirit and see that at work in our lives. What are these psalms, these hymns, these spiritual songs? Of course, when we think of psalms, we're going to be drawn to the book of psalms in the Scriptures. Really, it, it's not necessarily just only those psalms, but it could be any form of poetic style content that sing of the praises of God and how He helps us in times of trouble and His goodness and His mercy. We may sing those and set those psalms to music, but they don't necessarily always need to be set to music as well. They could be sung spontaneously. They could be spoken to one another as well, but using the psalms in that form. We also have hymns, and often, too, we, we think immediately of all the hymns of the, the 18th century and, and that era, etc. But the thing is, it's not only limited to even these styles of hymns. Because we, we're saying, come thou fount of every blessing, or we might sing how great thou art, and so on. It's not something that the apostles or the early church was singing. They had their own hymns as well. We even have modern hymns today that we'll often sing that have also benefited the church as well. But whatever form that these hymns may take, usually these are rich with theological content. They teach us the truths of the Scripture and they help set our minds right, set our minds on Christ and all the things that God has done for us. They focus on His glory, His goodness and His grace. And thirdly, we then see spiritual songs. Some people might turn around and say, oh, this could be the modern choruses that we sing. But the emphasis here is looking at these spontaneous songs, songs that we might just burst out and want to sing, a song of encouragement, and it could be something that's done under the, uh, under the uh, anointing of the Spirit, um, whatever church context you're in. But you've got these spiritual songs, these spontaneous songs, these hymns, these psalms are used for the purpose of addressing one another, to build one another up, and so that we can collectively focus on Christ and worship Him. We see that here with one another. It is for that encouragement, that edification. But note that he says that we're making melody to the Lord with our hearts. And this is really where it begins. It all comes down to our heart, our core character. Do we live a life within us that's been changed and transformed? And what flows out of the mouth, what flows out from the heart is really a reflection as what's gone in. And we can, we can see that if God has truly changed us, we'll, we'll spend less time grumbling, less time complaining, and more time giving thanks to God for all that He's done for us. Remember these first three chapters of Ephesians we've been studying together, of everything that God, God has done for us. He's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We were far off, but He is the one that has brought us near. We couldn't save ourselves. He, by His grace... <coughs> has extended the hand to save us. 
He's brought us near and into relationship with him. We've been adopted. We've been made fellow heirs of the promise. And we have an eternity in glory to look forward to with him. Of all that he's done, does it make your heart want to burst forth in a psalm, in a hymn, in a spiritual song that you can praise him for all that he's done? Because it all comes from that heart of thankfulness. And so this is really where we always ought to give thanks. Verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the changed life that we should see, turning away from the old criticisms and the different things to now to the point where we we just want to submit to God in all things and we can give him thanks for all things that he's doing in and through our lives. And this is where we will go next week into what it looks like to submit to one another through our relationships in the home, between husband and wife and with children, our relationships in the workplace, in the church and in the world, a life that's lived in humility. But this is the call that we see today, the call to walk in wisdom. And so just like the early story that I opened with, you know, when we look at all the world's problems, if it comes down to ignorance and apathy, ultimately we know that all of the world's problems come down to the matter of sin. And it is sin is the corrupting factor. Our attention to the different things of the world are obviously going to be different in focus depending on whether we have Christ or whether we don't have Christ. We'll see it through a whole different set of lenses but the sense that, sorry, the core of the matter is really sin. And when we look at everything that Christ has done for us, do we want to live like fools, running around letting sin and being slaves to sin, slaves to unrighteousness, letting those things control us? Or do we want to respond to this call to walk wisely, a call to worship wisely, that in all things we would worship in a manner that God has prescribed for us? that we can give him the glory, the honour, the thanks, the praise in all aspects of our lives. When we come together as a church, that we can turn around and look at each other and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, knowing that we are glorifying God, giving him thanks and praise for everything that he's done in us. That is the call today. Will you respond to him? Will you be like the simple that's sitting on the fence? Will you be like the fool that will utterly reject God? Or will you put to death those things and put on Christ? Will you turn to him, accept the grace that he's uh, given us through pouring out his life on the cross to dying on behalf of us and our sins, that we can take upon ourselves his righteousness to live a life that's worthy of him? That is the call to wisdom. And a call to the will of God is our sanctification in and through that by the work of the Spirit in and through our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these brief yet powerful words. And Lord, as we respond to this call to walk wisely, to walk in wisdom, we pray, God, too, that you would speak to us from that. We know, Lord, that your word is God-breathed. It is inspired. It is there for our reproof, our rebuke, our correction, and our training in righteousness. Lord, as we look upon ourselves and we see the things in life that, uh, that are obviously sinful, that are contrary to your word, we pray, God, that you would convict us of those things. You would help us to get on our knees and seek forgiveness for those things. But Lord, that in all things, we would get up off our knees and live lives that are worthy of that to which you've called us, that we would walk in wisdom. And Father, we respond to that. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom as we read in the Proverbs. And we pray, Father, that we would fear you in all our lives, that we would live a life that's worthy of the calling to which we are called. Help us each and every step of the way. Give us your spirit to do that, to to guide us along the way. That through all things we would give you thanks, that we would sing praises that honour and glorify you, because you alone are worthy of all glory, honour and praise. And for this, we give you thanks. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.